Hello and welcome to this episode of How to Be a Great Player. My name is Guy and today we are looking at a way of elevating your game so that you're not just being one-dimensional when you play a role-playing game. So what do I mean by one-dimensional? Well, a one-dimensional player, in my opinion, is a player who arrives at the game, sits down at the table, pulls out their character sheet, and starts to react to what the GM is telling them. Now, that might sound like someone that is a pretty good player. They've arrived on time, they've got their character sheet, and they're listening to the GM. Those are very good things to have. Absolutely, they are. But that's only one dimension of role-playing, as far as I'm concerned. There is another level that you can take it to, and then another level beyond that that you can take it to, to create a three-dimensional space that you actually call role-playing. And I see it sometimes done by certain players whom I consider to be absolutely exceptional players, and I often, often see other players just not doing it. And as a result, I feel that their experience is far less than players who engage in three-dimensional role-playing. So, three-dimensional role-playing is effectively the idea that there are three levels to the game. There is the surface level, which is the my character does X to overcome Y. The problem is placed in front of us. We need to attack orcs. We need to cross a bridge. We need to negotiate with the king. I have stats. I have my character laid out in front of me. I will use those to overcome the problem that has been presented to me. That is the first level. The second level, as far as I'm concerned, is the inter-party relationships. That is where you are dealing with your fellow characters within the game. Now, that is certain things that you do that cause you to then engage with those individuals. And then the third level is engaging with your fellow players, but in a very specific way. And again, that's a way that I haven't seen done very often, and yet can be the most entertaining part of the character interactions for a particular session. So we're going to unpack those three different layers. Well, we're not going to unpack the top layer. The top layer is how to be a good player in terms of arriving on time and having your character sheet and listening to the GM and then reacting according to how the GM describes scenes and things. That, there are videos are plenty on. We're going to talk about the next two levels. The inter-character relationship. So why is an inter-character relationship important? What does it allow you to do? What it allows you to do from a psychological perspective is you start to see the character sitting across the table from you next to you you start to see that character as being real once that character starts to have non-issue related things happening to them if you think about your colleagues at work or in varsity or in school or wherever you happen to have colleagues if you don't know personal history about those colleagues, they are really just colleagues. Bill in accounting, Shelley up in HR. Yeah, they're nice. But if Bill in accounting were to leave tomorrow and be replaced with Stan in accounting and that's all that happened, you wouldn't really notice. You wouldn't really care as long as the accounts were done and you were paid at the end of the month. It's the same with Shelley in HR. If she were to fire herself for sloppy work and get replaced by Ethel, well, as long as Ethel doesn't smell of garlic, you're okay. But if you were to ask Shelley about her life and discover that she has three kids, two Pomeranians and a cockatoo, which she got from Australia when she was kayaking across the uh, deserts of Australia, uh, which was a feat in itself, considering that there's no rivers out there, then you might care a little bit when Shelley leaves. You might have some say in the matter when the boss comes to you and says, do you think we should sack Shelley? No, I don't think we should sack Shelley at all. I think she's absolutely fantastic. I think she's a hard worker and she's dedicated and she's got determination and grit. So suddenly that person starts to have more meaning for you. But what is that meaning that she has for you? It's in your head, really. You've shared some personal data with each other, and as a result, you now care what happens to Shelley. 
If you then go and socialise with Shelley, heaven forbid, and you start to go out for drinks and maybe dinners and you meet her husband or her wife and you meet her children, as obnoxious as they are, she starts to have a more indelible impression upon you. And of course, if you like that individual, you'll start to build relationships and friendships and so on and so forth. Again, she becomes more real in your head. There's nowhere else for her to become more real. Shelley in front of you is as real as she's going to get. It's all of the nonsense that you spew at each other out of your mouths and show in photographs and selfies and phone pictures and Facebook, all that kind of stuff, that makes them more real. Because it's now in your head rather than just in front of you. So the same thing applies for inter-character relationships. If the person sitting next opposite you is supposed to be this gruff dwarf, or this half-orc fighter, or a Klingon, or a whatever. If you ask them in, quest in character, and you ask them questions about their character, and they answer them, the character starts to become more real. You start to care about that character a little bit more. What are some of the questions that you can ask that character in game? Now, I've jotted them down so that I don't forget them. So excuse me while I just look at my notes down here. Oh, yes. Questions like, so where do you come from? What's your history? That can be useful. That can, to a degree, help inspire this friendship that you're going to start building. However, questions like that are, well, I come from the seven trees out there near Oakendall. That's completely imaginary because it is an imaginary world. It's completely accurate because, well, you want your character to have come from that imaginary world. However, as a person, you're sitting there going, yeah, OK, I know where that is on the map, but I have no personal connection to that whatsoever because it is in a fantasy environment. In real life, if Shelley told you that she comes from Manhattan, well, if you've ever been to Manhattan, you've seen Manhattan, you know of Manhattan because it's a real place. You can start to form a connection with it. So the kinds of questions that you should be asking into character are not questions that are going to elicit fantastical or imaginary responses. They're questions that are going to elicit real responses, and that is what you will be able to link onto. So it's questions like, what do you want? Now, the dwarf might be sitting there going, I want to slay that dragon. You say, well, that's a fantasy creature. Sure. But the act of slaying the dragon requires your character and you as the player, that player and their character, to go on quests together, to physically roll real dice or whatever it is you're doing, but to physically engage with one another through dialogue, discourse, dice rolling, rules, whatever the case might be, to ultimately get to slaying that dragon. So it's a physical reaction that you are going to engage in with this individual to get there. So now the dwarf starts to have a bit more value to you. And as you go on that quest, that value will only deepen. So then you can go further. You can say, well, that might be what you want now, but what do you really want? The character might not know. If I were to ask you in real life, what do you want? You might flippantly respond a bagel or a pizza or a whatever gets the juices flowing. But what do you really want? What do you want out of life? That's a scary question that a lot of people don't know how to answer. And I myself have actually been struggling with that question recently as well. What do I really want? I'm nearly 40 now. I've got to realize that I'm getting older. I only feel as if I'm 13 or 14. But what do I really want? That's an interesting question. It's something that you are going to have to answer personally and for your character. I think it might be easier for the character, actually, than it is for yourself in real life. But that's a whole different direct <laughs> digression. I apologize. All right. So then the next question that you ask. So what is it that you want? What do you really want, dwarf? Once they've given you an answer, you then ask this next question. How can I help you? How can my elf help your dwarf? Again, this is simply creating a real requirement, not a fantastical one. I have to roll dice and use my statistics and my abilities to aid your character. That's the mechanics that's happening in the background. But you ask the question, how can I help? 
This will start to build a sense of rapport. You both have got the same goal now. You're both walk, working towards the same end. You're building this intellectual connection with physical action. That's how we work as human beings. And when you achieve that accomplishment, spiritually, there will be the sense of accomplishment. We have done this. We have defeated the dragon together. And yes, it was hard, but we did it. Now that dwarf is much, much more real than they were when they were just, you know, Brian playing the dwarf. You ask if they say, well, you can't really help because you're not a combatant. So then you say, okay, well, what can I do? How, what can I help with? Can I research? Can I do this? So you start to entrench yourself in that individual. Then you can ask, is there anything troubling you? Now, this might, might be construed as something that's purely fantastical. On the other hand, it's also a good way of finding out what the player's doing in terms of their character. If the dwarf is having difficulty, well, I really have difficulty connecting with you because I find you a bit of an ass. A were-ass, actually. <laughs> I find you an ass. Well, why is that? What can I do to change that? What is it? Is it my character's attitude? Is it how my character works with you? And of course, if you replace the words with I instead of my character, it becomes a lot more real, which is why a lot of people don't like to do it because then it becomes too real. You can then ask questions like, well, do you want to know what I want? And hopefully, if the player is a good player, a multidimensional player, they will say, yes, what is it that you want? So you can start to build that inter-party relationship, that kind of, that, that real social aspect that we don't necessarily see from players. The third dimension is the inter-player connection. Now, you can do these in either order. There's no specific way, and you can do them at the same time. Again, there's no specific order to doing it, but... What becomes important is the fact that you are asking these questions. Now, the interplayer stuff happens a little bit more frequently than the interparty stuff happens. But again, still not that frequent in order for everyone to be doing it unwrote, as far as I'm concerned. So in between sessions, not during the session, please, but in between sessions, before a session, after a session, via chat, however you want to do it, it's asking the other player, and I've said this before, what do you want from the game? I know you want your dwarf to kill the dragon, but do you want your dwarf to be like a superhero? Do you want them to sacrifice themselves when they get to killing the dragon? Do you want them to kill the dragon and then retire? Do you want them to form a relationship? What do you want from, your, from the game? What do you want from it? Is it just pure comedy? Is it pure entertainment? This question helps you in terms of then how to adjust how you play with the person. If the person says, oh, no, I just want a good story, that's all. Ah, you want a good story. Okay, so now we can start to make more complicated stories because just hack and slash is a bit dull. So if you adjust your playing to now, instead of just charging in through that front door, you now say, mm, I see all of that. Let's come up with a sneaky way in. Let's use the old noggin to come up with a plan. You're now engaging your fellow player and trying to elevate the game to what they want. That's a fantastic place to be in. The GM should be doing this all the time anyway, but you as a player can assist with that process by guiding it. If the player says, oh, I just want I just want to kill stuff. I just use this as a stress reliever after the end of the week. I just want to kill stuff. Well, that's also a clue on how you can then play the game as well. Don't vacillate. Don't oscillate when decision making comes. Make the choice that will lead you to the most violence. If that's what that player wants, you can support them. They should be asking you the same questions and you should perhaps be balancing it out, of course. I'm not just saying that you must now bow down to your fellow players. It's a two-way street. This reciprocity is the name of the game. You can then also ask them why do they want that from the game? If they say they just want to kill creatures because they want stress relief, well, maybe there's something more to it. Stress from what? Is it stress from home? Is it stress from work? If it's stress from home, then maybe you don't want to have your character have the strong interpersonal relationship with that character from a spousal perspective. Maybe it should be more comedic relief type of stuff. Because you don't want to press those person's buttons necessarily. You want to try and help them. Theoretically, they're your friend sitting across the table from you. All this is doing, though, is this is building a bond between you that becomes more visceral than just, hi, Pete, here's a beer, sit down and shut up. Unless that's what they want, they don't want to be engaged with. That's a different story. 
That will give you other questions. You then say, okay, well, how can we get it? So if you're chatting to Pete, apparently, you're chatting to Pete saying, well, what do you want? And Pete's saying, well, I'd really like a game where, you know, I'd like, I'd like the dwarf, I'd like the dwarf to, to realize his potential when he, when he goes through the game. If you then say, well, how can I help you get it? It could be a case where you then sit down and say, okay, well, what if Pete's potential, your dwarf's potential anyway, what if my character, what if my character needed to be saved from a problem, let's say an addiction, and your character did that? How can we, how can we play that out? You start to plot out events stories that you can add into the game they won't change the bigger picture of the game it just means that you're looking for opportunities to insert little bits of the story to allow pete to have his dwarf do whatever it is that he needs his dwarf to do to get that sense of satisfaction that sense of growth so that's a very interesting conversation that you can have and it starts to change the way you approach the game you're no longer just rocking up and listening to whatever it is that the gm spews out and then responding accordingly you're now jointly crafting this narrative so when you walk away from the table at the end of the evening it's not just a case of oh i rolled that natural 20 and then we did this and remember when the gm did that and then we did there's a whole lot more going on it's like yes we did this we did that Pete, did we make progress in terms of relieving your stress? Yes, we did. Oh, fantastic. I learned more about your dwarf. I now know what your dwarf wants, so we can now go after that. So now it becomes a much more collaborative space. It becomes a three-dimensional gaming environment, far beyond what normally just happens where everyone sits down, says hello, and then goes home afterwards. So a good example of that is in a game that I'm hopefully going to be part of. I'll be playing the role of the captain of this uh, starship. Uh, we're using the path uh, the Starfinder rule system. And one of the fellow, my fellow players, the first thing I did was I said, okay, cool. I'd like a relationship with somebody on the ship. I need some kind of familial relationship or this or that, or whatever it was. Or maybe he started the conversation and I followed, whatever. We decided that we're going to be brothers. I'm the older brother, he's the younger brother. But he is the younger brother who was convicted of a crime and instead of going to prison, my character, his brother, vouched for him and so took him onto the ship. Not a new story. The Killjoys, that sci-fi series, which I still don't know if I like or not. The Killjoys is exactly that premise. The brother comes on board as a favor and there's other... Anyway, so it's not a, it's not a unique story. How is that going to express itself out? Well, we sat and we role played through that initial awkward conversation where the brothers start shouting at each other because the elder brother feels the younger brother's irresponsible. The younger brother feels the older brother doesn't believe in him and doesn't support him in his decisions. The older brother doesn't know how he could possibly support his younger brother in stupid decisions. And that's where we are starting. This is before the game has even started. But as players, what we've agreed to is we've said we want to push this. We want to explore this. I've given the older brother other stuff which will be discovered. He's The other um, player has given his character stuff that my brother will discover as they play through, as they move through the story. We've also committed that this brother animosity will never get in the way of the main storyline will never cause other players' characters to lose an opportunity. So we won't ever get to the point where one brother storms off into the back room, the other brother storms off into the other room, and nothing happens. The brothers might disagree. I don't think we should go onto the spaceship. I think we should go onto the spaceship. You're an idiot. You're an idiot. Ultimately, though, at the end of the day, the brothers will move together. Well, if you're going, then I might as well go to make sure that you don't mess it up. Or if you're going, then I might as well go, someone's got to carry your walker because you're an older brother. So there is a commitment to following the narrative, to not letting our story get in the way, but in exploring that story as the game goes on and seeing where it takes us. There's a wonderful opportunity for reconciliation, for the hatred to bubble over and for the one player's character to leave, but that causes the other 
brother to go after him. It's just a great, great mix for us to, to play with and to explore. It will make those characters a lot more real when we converse in that style. Now, what helps is that we both play in the I, the first person uh, perspective. So when I'm talking to my brother, I I feel that you are, you're an irresponsible idiot. He feels that I'm an overprotective, overbearing brother, which does take me back to my relationship with my real life sister, actually. But anyway, that's a different story. Maybe it'll be cathartic for me to work through what I should have said to her and could have said to her and what I didn't and all that kind of wonderful stuff. We're very good. We're very close now. Uh, it only took us 34 years. Um, so the idea is that you are now pushing your role playing from being one dimensional, just role playing to now being this complicated intersocial environment where you have genuine thoughts and feelings for the other players and the other players characters because you know them so much better. You've built much stronger bonds with them than just dealing with stats on a piece of paper. I hope this has inspired you to perhaps try and branch out and to reach out to see what the world of emotional entanglement is like and hopefully to find that your game is just that much better, that much more real and that much more entertaining. Until next time, hit that like button if you uh, like the content. Hit the subscribe button if you want to join our massive legion of fans who all believe this is the way to play. And uh, until next time, I wish you and your character happiest of